Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your host for this evening, Young Woman Engineer of the Year 2020, Ella Podmore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honestly, it's such an honour to be here and it's really cool actually being the one asking the questions for once. <laughs> but my name is Ella Podmore. I'm going to be hosting the Fireside Chat today and we're going to be having the outgoing and incoming president. So without further ado, let me introduce Professor Danielle George. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really nice being the one asking questions. How are you? Oh, good, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Before we start though, can we just um, do a, a round of applause? Um, hopefully every, what, everyone watched the, the President's address, Julian's address. It was amazing today, mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. Well done, Julian. There was something in there for everyone, I think. And, uh, and I loved your t-shirt as well. It was amazing. <laughs> 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 Whilst we're in clapping mode, can I um, also just extend the clapping um, and say a real personal thanks as well to um, the legend that is Peter Bonfield as well. He was a president before me. He really prepared me uh, for being president and, and helped me throughout my, and supported me throughout my, uh, th throughout my year as well. And he is somewhere, there he is, there. Yes. Well done, Peter. And how are you feeling today? Good, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like a, a fruit salad of emotions, though. Yes. You know, um, I feel, uh, you know, hugely honoured to, to have been president. Um, so, so excited um, uh, and so proud of, of what we've done mm -hmm. over the past year. And it's a huge team effort, you know, ac across the world. Quite sad that it's come to an end as well. Yeah. Tiny bit relieved. <laughs> a little bit more time back. Um, no. But really excited for, for this year and where Julian's going to take us and our institution as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit later. But you have been president through a really exciting time. So the IET's 150th year. Has there been any standout moments for you? Oh, blimey. I, I mean, everything's just been standout, really. You know, it's what we've done, um, you know, taking what we do normally and just sort of amplifying it. Mm -hmm. Um, loads of new stuff that we've done. Um, I got to be a cheeky elf in Santa Love STEM, which was brilliant. <laughs> um, As presidents uh, do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, and we, we talked about sort of going outside that engineering bubble and, and making sure that people who perhaps don't recognise themselves, you know, within engineering. I think we popped that bubble, not just went outside it. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we've, we've championed difference makers around. I think the standout thing for me, though, is because it was virtual quite a lot of it was virtual because of of the year yeah. uh, you know the pandemic and lockdowns and things how we did it you know and, and the fact that we did have such a big global audience which is amazing and um and the volunteers as well i think the iet volunteers in a year where actually all of them could have gone do you know what we've just got so much going on in my own life at the minute i haven't really got time to volunteer they didn't they went even so there was even yeah. more volunteering than there was before so i think that's probably the standout is in a in a very strange year that we all had the amount of, of volunteering that went on was just incredible globally yeah absolutely something i've noticed as well being virtual the reach that we've had has yeah. been fantastic yeah. hasn't it right i think we ought to bring in our next guest now so without further ado let's introduce the current iet president air marshal sir julian young Now 
snazzy video. <laughs> snazzy video. <laughs> How are you? You're right. No, very good indeed. Very excited. Um, not the relieved bit. I think I'm just daunted, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think there's more than a little bit of dauntedness. But uh, no, very pleased. Very delighted to uh, be in the position. An honour and a privilege. Oh, well, well deserved. And you've got quite a title, to be honest with you. Air Marshal Sir Julian the Young. That yes. was a mouthful for me just then. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. What, what do you like to be known as? Well, if I can tell you a little bit of a story. So in my last job, uh, well, firstly, I am proud, firstly, of the Royal Air Force Link. Um, I mean, all of the work that I've done with the IET has been in my time in the Royal Air Force. I retired from the Air Force on 31st of January last year. So in some respects, I shouldn't be wearing my uniform, but I wanted to wear my uniform this evening just to retain that link with the past. Uh, there's a couple of ex-chief engineer of the RAFs in the room, and there's the current RAF chief engineer in this room. And thus, it's, uh, it's important. I wanted to make sure the RAF had a strong link with the IET in, uh, in the years to come, really, and that we'd actually kind of had some influence. So as of uh, this particular do, as it were, I will probably lose the air marshal from a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, and probably not wear uniform unless there's a great advantage in so doing for the IET. Uh, save, except, include church services or Remembrance Sundays and those sorts of things. So uh, enough is enough. I'll, uh, I'll lose that bit, as it were. But in terms of the Sir Julian Young bit, I had a um, large team in my last uh, work in the Defence Equipment and Support Organisation, made up of military, there were civil servants and contractors. And the great thing about it was that um, all of the civilians, whether they were civil servants or contractors, called me Julian, and all the military, as you would normally expect, called me Sir. Um, now... You can just call me Julian for everybody. <laughs> Without my uniform, I'm just Julian. Julian. So that's cool. I wondered where that was going. I thought you were going to say King Jules or something. <laughs> well, there's, I, won't, I won't bore you with the story on that, but uh, I could. <laughs> Want to bring us a wine later? Oh, so, Julian, how does it feel to be the current IET president? Well, as I said, it's, um, it's very exciting. Um, I think the, you know, the harsh reality of it is, is the year will pass by so very quickly. Mm. And it is the case of just trying to put as much in as you can to benefit clearly the IET and its members and our own causes, the mission, the strategy, everything. But along the way, I do expect to have a lot of fun with it as well. Uh, the fun part really is meeting probably the members that uh, sadly, um, you know, Dan, you had the chance of meeting lots of members, but not you know, face to face. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm rather hoping that we'll be able to do more of that in the future. And that will make it uh, a lot more fun meeting people. Yeah, absolutely. And you've been quite busy already. You've been up to something rather special on Tuesday. Could you tell us a little <laughs> yeah. bit about it? OK, please? so <laughs> I'm pretty certain there's going to be an embarrassing photo. Of it. Here we go. <laughs> but the, um, in a second or two. But the, so I was given my state honour um, in um, January 2000, and I was due to go to Buckingham Palace for, to see, well, you don't know who, whichever member of the royal family it is, but uh, to go and do that thing on the 18th of March uh, last year. And then two days before, I got a text to say, don't bother coming, it's cancelled. Uh, because of COVID, clearly, it was just about to we enter the first lockdown. And then the next day, I got a telephone call to say, you did get the text, didn't you? Uh, but I was talking to somebody yesterday or Tuesday whilst we were at, um, at Windsor Castle there um, who had actually was already in the car going for the same date as me, the 18th of March. They were already in the car going before they realised it had been cancelled. So it was a bit, bit uh, touch and go, but it was a, yeah, a wonderful occasion. Um, and uh, the best bit, which, uh, yeah, the best bit is uh, my wife was there too. So wow. it was good. Incredibly impressive. Thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. Many congratulations. Thank you. And what you both have uh, promised and did it was to raise awareness for engineers, technologists across the world. And Dan, you launched the Make a Difference campaign. So can you tell us a bit about it and why it was so important? Yeah, I mean, we, so we wanted to shine a light on, on engineers, technologists um, all around the world and, and the sort of amazing work that they're doing. Um, and... And so we wanted to sort of what is a good sort of campaign for that? Well, they're all difference makers. So let's yeah. launch difference makers, show show how much of a difference these people are making to our society every day globally. Yeah. Um, so so we launched that and I, I got to talk to 
just some amazing people around the world and and I know much more about all the engineering that's going on now so hopefully other people you know watching the interviews and things will know a lot more about about what's going on and it's um and that's just the start of it you know it wasn't just a, a one-year thing you know we want to carry on doing spotlights on difference makers around the world and they could be you know from from primary school to mm -hmm. you know 100 years plus everyone can be a difference maker in engineering and technology we want to carry on shining a spotlight on them absolutely and do you have a particular difference maker that that you would call your idol or someone that you follow now yes um, <laughs> No, I don't really. Um, I, I mean, they were all, all the people I, I spoke to were, were incredible, mm. you know, in, in their own way. Um, and, and they had such passion, all of them had such passion that, you know, if they were talking about sort of materials engineering, I was like, wow, you know, I, I want to be a materials engineer now. Yeah. And, wow, <laughs> I want to do you know, whatever they were doing. It was like, I really wanted to do that. And, and so their passion came across and all of them. But, um, but no, I don't have a favourite one. Absolutely. And did you have a particular uh, a difference maker or someone who inspired um, you to get into the forces? Well, into the forces, if we go that far back, I guess my, my father, who was an RAF technician by training. He was an apprentice, though, to be fair, he and discipline didn't really get on. So he <laughs> took the first opportunity of leaving the Royal Air Force and then did. But he went on to work with British Airways. He was a propulsion technician. And I remember him taking me to Heathrow to see an RB211 engine in the test bed. And the, the vibration and the power was so high, and the jet engines are even more powerful these days now, you know, 40, 50 years on. Mm. But, the, um, but you could put your hand against the wall and feel bits of the wall kind of shaking and vibrating. I then had a stepfather who, um, who we seemed to spend every weekend keeping his car going. Uh, so I got very used to, I think the engine was in and out on Velcro, actually, it was in so often. So that gave me, <laughs> gave me a feeling for technology. Um, and I think if I think back to the Air Force, um, I, think I, I think of three air marshals that some of the people here in the audience will know. Hard taskmasters, um, but gave, always gave me the flexibility and freedom I needed. Uh, and luckily, um, you know, everything turned out okay. But that would probably be Peter Scott, uh, David Saunders and Sir Colin Terry, who for many of you again will know he went on to be the, um, uh, the president of the Royal Aeronautical Society. So uh, there are a couple of parallels there. Mm. So uh, clearly I've gone down the right route. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Excellent, yeah. And you've mentioned about your father being a technician there, and that's kind of one of your main yeah. drives as being president in the IET. You want to celebrate what technicians are doing. Can you tell me a bit about how you're going to do that and why is that so important that we celebrate technicians? Um, well, I think it's important. If we think about the Engineering Council, they set out three levels. Uh, C Eng, I Eng, and engineering technician, or be it I C T technician at the same at the same time, and it really is a case of I, we we you know we do not have enough people registered at that level, and yet there are hundreds of thousands, verging on probably more than a million people working at that level, and it just seemed a great shame for us to be missing those out, and for those of you who saw the lunchtime um, live stream uh, broadcast of the presidential address. You'll note, and I'll just give you the stats again, you know, there are 30, 32,000 people in the Royal Air Force. 38% of them are technical professionals. And only, so that makes 12,078 12, on the last count. Uh, under 1,200 of those are engineer officers. The rest of them are technicians. And we have not really done enough to try and promote their membership of any of the professional engineering institutes. And I rather hope that we can do this this year because you know, there's a lot of people out there. And uh, one, of the, the, you know, one of the motivations for me, uh, and I was only talking to Corporal Gouda, who's, who's here as a professional registered technician of about a year ago from RAF Odium, was that um, it really was a case of trying to make that transition for RAF or military folk into civil, civilian life. I mean, short of a lottery win, everybody has to meet, leave the military and get a job afterwards. And it can be difficult at times to transfer that skill and knowledge. Whereas if one is professionally registered, I would hope that at least some part of that passport of transfer is well stamped, mm -hmm. as it were. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. 
And so reflecting on what you've done throughout this year, Dan, you did a lot of work with encouraging people getting involved in STEM. We introduced the Engineering Open House Day where we had a paper plane competition, which <laughs> I don't know. Julian <laughs> just knocked it out of the park, didn't you? Yeah. What was yours, seven yeah, meters or something? Yeah. Goodness me, that's my question. I did really badly, but that's probably why I'm a materials engineer. But <laughs> do you feel like you achieved everything that you wanted to achieve and set out to do at the beginning of the year? in terms of encouraging people to take up in STEM and putting the message out there? Yeah, I think, I think we did. Um, I think it's, you know, we had, we had all these amazing difference makers, like really, really amazing difference makers. And, I, you know, I, I got to, they're like engineering rock stars. You know, you, you, you get to chat to these people and, and they're inspiring me and I already love engineering. Yeah. So I know they're going to be inspiring other people as well. You know, I got to, People who are just smashing stereotypes, you know, like um, uh, Anne Marie Imaffedin, mm. June Angelides, you yes. know, the, the whole diversity agenda in engineering is so important. And they're just smashing it to bits, which is brilliant. Um, electronics is my thing. I got to talk to Sophie Wilson about, you know, the BBC Micro and the ARM architecture. Um, Eben Upton about Raspberry Pi, you know, yeah. just so inspiring. Um, and it, there was, I got to talk to a guy um, in Africa. Asqua uh, um, Nongoli, and um, and he is making uh, water purification nanofilters for Africa, mm. and he set up a business, and he is just completely changing his communities in Africa with the engineering he's doing. You know, and you're listening to all this, and you're chatting to them, and you just want to give them a cuddle. You know, you just yeah. like this is just amazing, <laughs> incredible work. Yeah, and you know, and I think. All of these stories are inspiring that next generation, and it's so important that we do inspire the next generation. Absolutely, and have such a fun year doing it as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and listening to all these events, being like, God, that's incredible. <laughs> um, and Julian, as you take the presidency forwards in this next year, what do you hope to achieve? What, do you, what are your main points that you want to get across as president? Golly. Um, I mean, I said that I wouldn't have a specific initiative sh short of shining a light on technicians, but to be fair, the IET has already got a lot of steps in place to try and increase the numbers of, of, uh, of technicians. Um, but, you know, with a, bit more with a bit more encouragement, we'll get even more, which will hopefully continue beyond my time. Um, but I think it is a case of, uh, I, what I really said that I would do is communicate and consolidate our strategy. Uh, I mean, we sat around reading it and you know, dissecting it, so many trust board yeah, meetings yeah. and strategy days, <laughs> whiteboards and all sorts of things that I'm genuinely very proud of it. Mm. I think it actually set some really good targets for our institution. And I think the societal uh, themes, as it were, the challenges that we're facing in the future, uh, uh, we've hit the nail on the head, as it were, it's exactly what we need to do. Yeah. And so I will hopefully communicate it and consolidate it and embed it into almost everything that we do. Mm. Um, you know, that's not to say that Nigel and the team aren't already doing that, but I'm going to help. <laughs> that's lovely. And do you have any words of wisdom for, as Julian starts his year as president? <laughs> well, we spoke about this a few weeks ago, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was good. Um, I mean, have fun and you know julian knows that already but you must be the same with with your year now just don't blink don't ever blink because it's like that it's yeah. over absolutely. so you know it's it goes so quick it is it absolutely be flowing yeah. yeah absolutely and so i know you're at the start but do you have any takeaway points that you're already learning being in this position that you're going to finish the year with is there anything that strikes you that you're going to be like wow this is a big um takeaway for me um, I think if we get to the end of the year and we have put in place the, uh, you know, a greater level of attractiveness to technicians to become members, I think if we've got all of our members and volunteers understanding about the strategy and starting to communicate about that strategy, having been given that kind of direction, these are the things which we think are important. And if they're actually doing that themselves and writing papers and conferences and, and actually just talking about those in a much more um, organised way, may I say, I think that, again, we'll have the opportunity to go further much faster mm -hmm. than we would do if, indeed, we were uh, more... Uh, disparate, as it were. So I'm very much hoping that the strategy will allow us to do that. Mm. Um, I'm very aware that, you know, a year passes by, as I mentioned earlier, so very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. But um, if we're on the path to do that, I will feel that it's been a year very worthwhile. Brilliant. And then we 
touched upon it earlier, but COVID obviously has had a big impact on my year as Young Women Engineer of the Year, your year mm-hmm. as president as well. So what big uh, key points has it impacted during COVID? I mean, the majority of your addresses and your speeches have been in the living room, of course. And Yeah, yeah. A lot of people know my office at home now. <laughs> I and feel what like it, what I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was a, a lot from, from home, a lot virtually. Um, but, you know, and, and, and that's obviously not good. You, you want to be out talking to people but like I said before you know actually the reach that we had globally yeah. has been a real positive um, and you know if, if anyone's going to do virtual stuff good it's going to be us right because we've got an amazing team yeah um, and and being able to do that with the team we've got you know from um, you know within you know, we've got IET.tv you know could we've done as much as we did without without them they're just incredible and and so we've We've got the skills, we've got the um, the experience in house to make it what we've made it that year. So, so yeah, it was sort of all virtual, but actually there's some real positives that have come from it as well. I completely agree. I mean, we talked about the reach of where we can get our message across globally and that's fantastic. And I think for me as well, I almost felt like I could do more because of the time that you would normally take traveling yeah. or getting settled in. So I found myself signing up to like many different things and it was actually, you know, making an impact um, at many more events than if I were to do it in person. But as the events now become more in person, what kind of key things have you got in your calendar that you're looking forward to? Um, well, this is a pretty big gig, I guess, uh, to, to start the year <laughs> yeah. off with. Um, I think the, the first one, uh, first real engagement with, uh, with, with, uh, with members, in fact, I put in the diary absolutely ages ago, and it's in fact down in South Wales at Swansea. Uh, they've got a conference um, or a lecture, rather. I think I'm probably giving the lecture, and the uh, and an evening meal. So I'm really looking forward to seeing them, and hopefully that's but, but the start. So I've had lots of invitations come in in the last week, uh, and I guess there'll be some more. Um, and I'd also like to think that we will get the opportunity to step back on the global uh, stage again, uh, recognizing that um, you know we're an institution with so many overseas members, and that we truly do have a global presence. And uh, clearly for the last 20 months, we've not been able to do that at all. And indeed, you know, you've done a fabulous job uh, virtually. Um, it, it, you know, some of the emails that I've had recently have said, yes, that's great, but we want to, we really want to see you. So I'm rather hoping that the, in, you know, the individual international COVID rules will allow us to do that yeah. at some point in the future. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Whether the next year. Yeah. Let's hope. And you talked about the, the strategy that you've both been working on. So if we look within the next 10 years until 2030, what kind of key things have you guys put in towards that strategy or any changes that you, you have made? We'll, we'll start with you, Julian. Okay. And then... Well, there's a couple of targets in there, and one of which is to try and get membership up to 200,000. Um, we're at 158,000 at the moment. In fact, we're probably slightly just less than that because we've still trying to touch base with the students who are just starting yeah. university their year, um, which again, that's part of the reason why it's been so difficult in the last uh, 20 months to sustain those numbers. But, um, so we'll have, um, you know, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a doable target, certainly by 2030. I'd love to think that we can actually do it a bit earlier than that. It's also a case of trying to get to 100,000 professionally registered within that membership. Mm. And again, I think, again, that's a very re- a realistic target. Yeah. Particularly, and I keep going on about it, I don't mean to, but with technicians, there being so many, the opportunity to gain technician members. So long as always we can articulate the exact uh, same message that, of course, we have all had to do is kind of what's in it for me. Yeah. Um, and I just rather hope that we can do that to a larger audience and get those numbers. But in simple terms, I hope we're still relevant yeah. to what we're doing. And I hope that we're still pushing hard. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And pushing those boundaries as well, yeah. you know, making sure that, that we are the, the institution of the future. We, Absolutely. we make sure that you know, we change and adapt to whatever our members and volunteers need as well. Um, the digital futures agenda really excites me. I think there's so much that we can do in that space. 
Um, but I think there's, you know, in terms of that sort of professional registration and getting more engineers interested in it, there just feels in that strategy there's something for everyone in it, you know, yeah. no matter what you're interested in, there's something in it for you. So, but it's the digital futures bit that really excites me. Yeah, and actually looking towards the next 150 years with the IET, I guess that's something that we should really explore more. It's given us great reach across the COVID, um, the pandemic, and hopefully we can do many more digital events and have greater effects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And still manage to get that reach. It's sort of that balance, isn't it, between, um, you know, having still, still get trying to get that sort of global reach um, and all the good things that virtual stuff does but not replacing all the time that sort of um, mm. in person that face to face because you just there's sometimes you just can't replace that absolutely so essential and then after your incredibly busy year what's next for you then um, well we we had a really exciting um, meeting this morning actually here on the digital poverty alliance the IET is a a uh, founding partner in the Digital Poverty Alliance, and that's to to end digital poverty in this country once and for all by yeah. 2030. Um, that is such an exciting agenda. So I'm going to um, hopefully stay stay involved with that, which will be really good. Oh, you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm um, talking to a publisher about writing a book, which will be quite wow. interesting. Oh yeah. my gosh. Um, my husband's like, really? You need another challenge so quickly, really? <laughs> That's it. You just keep on the base, yeah. Um, but um, but spending some more time with with my daughter here, Elizabeth, maybe doing some some Lego. Do you want to come up? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. Around. So you're going to do some. Um, you've been doing Lego, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and tell everyone what what you've been making with your Lego. What have you been making? Uh, I've been making. <coughs> oh. I've been making a um, cafe truck. A cafe truck with oh, a Lego. Wow. Yeah, Business you enjoyed cafe. it, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to do a bit more Lego. Um, David Lakin today was sort of saying, "Come on, let's get him into the Lego League first. Yes. Lego League, so we might do some Lego as well, and um, and music as well. I don't know if everybody else finds this, but engineering and music just seems to go so well together, or, or any STEM subjects and music seem to go well together. So, wh what are you um, what are you learning at the moment? The recorder. The recorder. <laughs> Some lovely tunes in our house at the minute. I hope you're yeah. better on it than ever I was. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you're going to be an engineer? Maybe. <laughs> the right answer. Oh. Oh. She'll be happy to have some more mum time <laughs> in this next year. <laughs> That's lovely. And so we talked about the events coming up um, for you as new president. What's the, the first official engagement apart from tonight? Uh, well, I think I, I mentioned uh, properly it will be down in South Wales. Uh, but um, again, the, the diary is filling up, uh, you know, quite fast. And I look forward to, I look forward to all of them, um, recognising that, uh, again, uh, it's like for all of our audience, you know, the membership is our audience. Uh, we're not here to enjoy ourselves, as it were. We're here to try and promote, you know, what they want, what the institution wants. Uh, but certainly there's going to be a lot of fun along the way and enjoyable. Yeah. So. Lots of fun. Loads of Lots fun. Lots of fun, yeah. 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 As we've Lots had from Dan's here. Loads of fun. <laughs> so, key topic of the night with you has been technicians. So, yes. what is the IET going to do in order to help support their engineering skill set and equip them with what is quickly changing in the technology landscape? Uh, well, I was only talking to uh, Michelle Richmond about this uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, working up on a paper to come to the Board of Trustees uh, to say actually what those extra steps are going to be. Uh, quite simply, it is a case of encouraging, communicating with places where indeed we've got lots of people, lots of technicians out there working and fighting the battle, as it were, at, at every level, in every organisation. And, uh, and so if you recall, um, those of you who saw this lunchtime session, um, it was a case of asking, reaching right out to our members, to our fellows, to our members, and to our student and apprenticeship uh, members to say, please do your bit. Uh, please do your bit at your various levels to try and help influence the places within which you work, the companies that you deal with, and really building on, uh, on Peter Bonfield's concordat. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which again is, is there, it's still being successful, it's still trying to push hard professional registration across industry in a large, co large corporations. And that's what we need. We need almost the permission that this is a good thing. Because it absolutely is a good thing. Yeah. But if we can get that done at a corporate level to understand the value, and really the value comes, yes, it's going to cost you a little bit of money. I would say, actually, the value that you are then imparting on that individual to say, we care about you, we care about your skills. I think one of the things that we've got to do is look hard at our CPD and ensure that it actually matches the, the needs and the requirements of our technicians. But once that is the case, kind of why wouldn't you? Because this is pretty cheap training yeah. to be giving your workforce to be able to make them better um, and much more productive, much more innovative and much more up with what is going on yeah. in today's world. So uh, there's lots, there's so much scope that we can actually do. It's like that return on investment, isn't it? It is. You know, you get a huge a, return on investment. It's a relatively small amount of money. Mm. And I appreciate that, you know, the finance directors is always going to look at the bottom line. But the soft element that one gets from the benefits of professional registration and caring about the individuals within a particular yeah. organisation far surpasses the overall cost, mm. far surpasses yeah. value, a bit of retention possibly, but the skills that that person is going to take yeah. on board yeah. and the status they have, mm. which then allows people, as I've mentioned earlier, certainly from the military, to pass into civilian life and continue doing the job they were doing rather than take another, take another turn and we lose yet another uh, yeah. technical professional. Mm. Isn't no, it's what we want? so important. I think it's going to be really exciting to see what you're going to be able to do with the IET to make an impact on that. Absolutely. Yeah. And Dan, with the move and push towards net zero, how do you feel that this is going to impact engineering jobs and what is the IET going to be able to do to, to help that transition? Um, I think there's going to be a lot more jobs, different jobs to maybe than, than we're seeing now, but there's a, a lot more um, there's loads to do. You know, we need a resilient national grid. We need um, new battery technology. Lots mm -hmm. of engineers and um, technologists working on battery technology. The Internet of Things as well, you know, all that smart electronics, I think, can really help with that decarbonising agenda as well. So, so that I think there'll be, there'll be new jobs, more jobs um, in, in engineering. What the IET can do, back to Julian's point, really, in terms of the home for professional registration and the professional engineer, um, we can, you know, we work, we, we want to be there, the sort of lifelong um, professional home for engineers. And that can start as early as, you know, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and all the way up to uh, when you retire as well. And, and at the IET, we're already set up for that. You know, we've got fabulous education tools. Yeah. Um, great support for, for mid-careers, for, for university students for mid-career. Um, so, you know, we can be that professional home um, for engineers. Um, and I think that's what engineers are going to need to work towards this sort of net zero. Absolutely. And you've been a great advocate for engineering and the services, Julian. What do you see as challenges within increasing the number of engineering registr registrants in that sector? Uh, well, we, we have a, a bit of an advantage within the military in as far as in the last couple of years we've taken, uh, we've made some policy changes so that we now pay the fees, uh, professional engineering institutions, and indeed also offering a small financial bonus uh, for people who actually make the move to professional registration. Uh, again, that sum of money is not necessarily going to keep people in. It's not going to be a retention because, again, we've got some tremendous skills uh, that indeed are much sought after across the rest of the, the UK and probably the similar situation across the world. Uh, but ultimately, what I hope it does is it will be a retention positive measure. Um, and it will prove to be such because, again, it shows the value. And again, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a hackneyed phrase. And I'm not saying that the, the military is well paid or underpaid. But frankly, if you want to make a huge amount of money, you probably wouldn't work for the public sector. Uh, and so, you know, we, we take people who really believe in what it is that we do. Um, and that goes a long way in terms of motivation. Um, so. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm. And then if we go away from the, uh, the services for a minute and we yeah. talk about generally in technology. So in the next 10 years, where do you both get excited about what emerging technologies are coming through? Or do you have anything that you want to tell the audience to look out for? For instance, we'll go to Dan first. Um, I think um, nanoelectronics and sort of wearable tech, uh, I yes. think it's going to be so important, especially in healthcare. I think to be able to to have technology that that isn't sort of invasive at all, and you can just wear it all the time, yet it's monitoring you and it can pick up any early signs of anything that's going wrong, um, so things can be treated earlier. Yeah. I think that's that's really good and nano electronics thing for me. I love that. As a materials engineer, <laughs> I absolutely love that. I think wearable technology is definitely going to make a breakthrough and it's exciting to see where that can make a difference as well when we talk medically and not just for flashy clothes. <laughs> How about yourself, Julian? Um, I reckon automation in its greatest sense that um, uh, I think Danielle's right, there will be more jobs, but I think there'll be different jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think the, you know, the skills that will be needed in the future are different. We must need to get our mind around those digital skills and ensure that the entire workforce, no matter what their age is, are actually aware of those digital skills. But I think automation offers so many advantages in the future. Um, from a military perspective, we're still wrestling with trying to get um, certified, uh, I'll call them drones, a lot of people will grimace when I say that. Uh, but uh, our own project protector, which was one of my most exciting projects uh, during my time in the last job, uh, to be able to fly over the UK in unsegregated air, airways um, so that it has a sense and avoid, avoidance system that will actually allow it to you know, take the appropriate action if indeed two aircraft will come into close proximity, but actually doing a great thing. So will it be a spy in the eye, a spy in the sky rather? Yes, it will. But it's there to keep us safe as well, mm. because, you know, there are also, and we've not really touched on it, but there's, you yeah. know, there's bad people who are making use of technology as well. Um, so, again, that's one of those things that we must you know, take, a, take advantage of as well, is keeping up with it. Because if we heard, don't, yeah. Yeah. sure as heck others will. Yeah, yeah it's very true. Julian, talk to us about Eat, Sleep, Engineer, Repeat. So that is the <laughs> motto for this yeah. year's President's Address. It talk is. me through what that, that is. And is it really like that as an engineer? <laughs> well, uh, I think it is. Um, and I ought to say that it wasn't my first cut of the name of the presentation today. <laughs> uh, the comms and media team within the IET took a sort of a little bit of an exception to the one that I had. <laughs> which was by no means as exciting. But as soon as we kind of focused on what that might mean, uh, and you, if you've not seen the lunchtime session, the T-shirt the clearly has got to be worn. There's a purple T-shirt with <laughs> those words emblazoned on it, uh, just to try and make it look a little more different uh, virtually. But the, um, it, I think it's, that's what we do. I think engineers are special people. You know, I think that we have a particular mindset I think we're a restless group in, at large and that we're never quite happy with what we did. You know, if you, you, you know I, a number of times I could do something and somebody would say, gosh, that was really good. And I'm biting my tongue to say it wasn't that good <laughs> because I know already that there were flaws in what I did. Yeah. I know that I can improve it if only we had a bit more time or another go at it. And in fact, so I think we are, we, 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 we reflect I think on our own on our own achievements on the things that we do, and uh, and so I think we're we're special people. So I do think we do eat, sleep, engineer, repeat. There's a bit of time perhaps for some other things. Though for those of <laughs> it you feels know, like that though, doesn't it? For those it? of you who know me well, in my view, there's no, there's no time for anything else other than those things. <laughs> Oh. I saw a laugh there. That's probably true. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. You love what you do, and I think that's brilliant. Yeah. So, 150th year this year. Why was it important to celebrate that milestone with the IET, Dan? Well, I mean, we've, we've got such a rich history, haven't we, about you know, what, what we've done in the past 150 years, how we've contributed to society, how engineers have contributed to society. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was really important to, to celebrate that. You know, it's a, it's a massive milestone, 150 years. And, um, 
and being able to, to go into the archives. If, if people haven't done an archive tour, do it. It's amazing in, in the IET. It's, it's so good. Yeah. Um, and, and to yeah. see that sort of all the legacy things and, you know, that past engineers, past IET, IEEE, um, or telegraph mm -hmm. engineers have, have done in the past. Um, it was really important to sort of look back, but then celebrate the present, which is really important, and, and all the difference makers that are out there. And, you know, I chatted to... Uh, so many of them, but then also the future, you know, where is it going in the 2030 strategy, how we make sure, you know, where we have engineers and we're positioning ourselves to make sure we can still be really relevant to society as well. So, so 150 years just felt so nice to be able to do past, present, future as yeah. well. Um, and then let's see what it's like in 150 years. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It was a great, great example and reason to reflect and uh, just like you said, reflect on the past, celebrate what we're doing now, and then excitement for the future. The future as well. Yeah. yeah. So we're getting to the good questions now, right at the Are end. Okay. Yes. And so when we're talking about the archives and stuff, what do you see being your legacy with the IET? Oh, my golly. Um, big old last Yeah, question. big ask, actually. Well, every, everybody <laughs> wearing a T-shirt, clearly, uh, like me. That would be pretty cool. Um, I think... I'd like to be remembered for having, you know, been given the baton and we were already sprinting. Uh, I took it before the end of the box, so we didn't have to, didn't have our default. Good handover. We didn't kind of lose it. It was Excellent a good handover. handover yes, and seamless. I'd like to think that I'll continue running it and uh, pass it on uh, to Bob Cryan uh, next year and we'll be in good shape and we'll be, you know, slightly improved in a whole variety of ways, some of which I couldn't even now describe. Because as we know, you know, events happen and you have to take the opportunity when they present before you to try and do what's right at the time. And so to think that one could plan out the entire year and say, other than a few diary commitments, as it were, how everything is going to go, I rather hope that opportunities will come along. Yeah. I'd like to think that, uh, you know, that from a global stage perspective, opportunities in not actually having been there for 20 months or so now, that actually there'll be an opportunity maybe with another professional engineering institution from another country where indeed actually maybe we can collaborate a bit more here. Mm. Those sorts of things. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that we're not already, but I, I think I'm, I'm excited by the opportunities that might present themselves. I'm a naturally a collaborator. Uh, I like to collaborate. Uh, with various organisations to see if we can. I used the phrase earlier, I think by so doing we can go further faster. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll see, we'll see what comes out. But I'd like to think that I'll be running a full pelt uh, and get the baton across in good form to Bob and that we won't, uh, won't get a default and we'll get a gold eventually. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent point to leave us with on this fireside chat. Julian, Dan, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting this. And everyone, thank you so much for watching and have a good evening. <laughs>